Hi everyone, my name is Shorodip and I am an ESL speaker. I have been an ESL speaker ever since I started debating. I've grown up in Bangladesh, done my schooling in Bangladesh, and I have also trained EFL speakers from different countries as well. And a lot of what I'm going to cover in today's session is going to be about advices and suggestions for ESL and EFL speakers and how we can overcome some of the barriers that are presented to us. I would also like to note that my experience as an ESL speaker might be different from the experiences of ESL and EFL speakers from all over the world, but I'll still try to make sure that I crystallize some of the very common problems that I've seen myself and other ESL and EFL speakers face from the experience that I've gathered, gathered over the years. So I'm going to start with talking about the problems that we generally face, and I want to address three specific problems. I'm pretty sure there are more but three sort of very common problems that ESL and EFL speakers face and how to sort of overcome them, maybe some drills or maybe some advice as to how we can um, practice and how we can change our mindset in order to be able to overcome them um, in whatever way possible. So let's dive straight into the three problems that I want to talk about today. Number one is not being able to convey 100% of what you think. And I think this is a big problem for ESL and EFL speakers. Because we think about a particular problem or an argument or a response in debating, and sometimes we think about it in our mother tongue. A lot of the times, in fact, not just sometimes. And what happens then is when once we want to say it in our speech or ask it in a POI, we either get stuck or it just doesn't come through in translation 100%, um, because there are some things that will just get lost in translation quite in inevitably. So if you're thinking like, 100, then oftentimes you may be able to convey 70, 60. Um, if we are able to convey 80% of what we think, that's considered a success. So this is something that you may have to grapple with as an ESL or EFL speaker. Obviously, the best way to overcome this is to be able to think in English um, generally. Like a lot of people who are bilingual, multilingual, can think in different languages. They can think in English, they can think in Spanish, they can think in, think in French. Bangla, Hindi, Urdu, so many languages that they learn, they can think in all of these languages. And obviously that's a dimension of language learning that if you can access is amazing. And if you want to learn to be to that language to the extent to which you can think in that language, I think that's absolutely something that you can do. I think that just it doesn't doesn't just help you in debating. It helps you generally as well, because generally learning languages does open up certain aspects of our perspectives and our brain that that helps that it helps us build intelligence in one way or the other. Having said that, there are debate specific drills that you can do in order for you to overcome this barrier. And not necessarily that you have to think in English, but rather that even if you're thinking in your mother tongue and then translating it, which is true in a lot of the cases, like for example, when it comes to my case, I don't think I always think in English, but at the same time, I don't think I always think in my mother tongue either. It's a bit of a mix and match. And sometimes I have to translate and sometimes I don't translate because I've already thought of it in English. So it's just one of those things where you, you both can happen to you, but you need to be efficient in doing both. And this is a drill um, that I'll recommend, which will help you do both more efficiently. And the drill is very simple. Record a prime minister speech or a first affirmative speech, um, depending on whatever format that you're doing. Um, take either six minutes and 30 seconds if you're talking about BP or UADC format, which is um, Asian parliamentary, or seven minutes and 30 seconds for an Austral speech. Speech, right? Now, why is like 30 seconds taken away? For BP and um, for uh, UADC, it's obviously for the POI. For Australs in specific, it's because oftentimes like you have to integrate inputs from your team members as well. It's not just your input that goes into your speech. So in that sense, it probably should be less than that. Right? I think seven minutes and 30 seconds is fine. You could do eight minutes for hostels if you want to, given the fact that there is no POI as well. So that's fine. Um, you can sort of design your own drill in that sense. But what's important is in case of BP, you take 10 minutes of prep, prep time. And when it comes to hostels, you take 15 minutes of prep time and not more than that. Because not having the full length of the prep time to yourself helps you sort of prep faster, but also convey what you are prepping into, into your speech and sort of translate your thoughts into spoken language quite um, efficiently. And obviously when you do it first, it's not gonna be as great um, and it's gonna be, take a bit of time. But once you 
do this drill prep for like 15 minutes and then record a 7.30 or an 8-minute speech. Um, and you can listen to that recording or you may not listen to the recording. Honestly, I it doesn't make a huge amount of difference because the point at which you end your speech, you will realize the things that you were able to convey and you were not able to convey. If you're not able to realize them, then by all means, go and listen to that recording. I think that can help as well. And if you can get someone else, like a teammate or a coach to listen to that recording, great. But it doesn't matter if someone else doesn't listen to your recording. Because once you keep doing it, you'll see that even if you're doing nothing after that, like you do this drill, I do nothing. You don't check it. You don't think about it. You'll keep getting better. And you'll keep getting better debate-wise as well, even though I'm not addressing this in this particular session. You will keep getting better at prepping something quite efficiently, less than taking less than the amount of prep time that you'd be allocated in a tournament. Obviously, because in a tournament, you'd be talking to other people. That's why that prep time is like, you know, cut by that much time. And once you prep that and you're able to speak quite fluently and you're able to speak um, by conveying all of the material or even most of the material that you have prepped, that will that will give you a few tools to be able to overcome the problem of not being able to convey 100% of what you think. What are these tools? Number one, you will realize how is it is be how you better translate your thoughts in prep into speech, whether it be writing it in bullet points in your um, script, whether it be writing a good part of your skip, like maybe 50% or even 100% of, of your speech just written down because that's how you operate better. Whatever it is that helps for you, you will do it and you will make your prep more efficient and you will make your scripts more efficient in the way in which you can follow that script and essentially convey your thoughts in a speech. That practice is incredibly helpful and I would recommend that when it comes to practicing this drill, practice this drill independently. Even if you're doing practice debates with teammates where you can sort of, in a way, also get a practice of these things, this drill in specific is very, very useful for this problem because it allows you to self-reflect the most. And oftentimes you'll see that even if you don't spend much time afterwards thinking about this speech or listening to that recording, you'll see that two, three hours later, you catch yourself thinking, ah, I could have said this more efficiently. I could have thought about this more efficiently. I could have said these words that conveys my thoughts more accurately. And once you catch yourself thinking about that is the point at which you get better, is the point at which you improve your um, speaking, you improve the way in which you deliver the words that you think about. And that's how you make your speeches better. And it doesn't matter if you're a whip, it doesn't matter if you're a second speaker, it doesn't matter if you're a third speaker, do this drill and do that first affirmative or PM speech. Um, it's not just for first speakers, obviously. This is specifically for ESL and EFL speakers to be able to convey um, more of what you think. Now, the second problem that I want to cover is not being able to cover as much material. And this is something that's quite true for ESL and EFL speakers. Um, I would say there are some ESL and EFL speakers that I've seen that don't suffer from this problem, like in Pulic or Sajid, my teammate, who can still cover a lot of material despite being ESL. But for most of us, like for example, like if you look at me, um, or if you look at even um, Nikki, for example, Nikola Angelov, you'll see that a lot of us do are not able to sort of express or convey or cover as much material as like the typical EPL speaker is able to. And in those circumstances, it's important to sort of be wary of your own disadvantages, be wary of your own weaknesses, but also be wary of your strengths. And in this particular case, when you're not able to cover as much material as a typical EPL speaker, the most important thing that you need to understand is prioritization. And in order to convey to you how you can understand and how you can use the principles of prioritization in your debating, I want to share th something with you guys. I want to share a few things where I'll explain to you how you can think about prioritization, how you can think about generally improving your strategic sense in debating. Because the best way in which debaters or ESL and EFL debaters can overcome e ESL and EFL bias is through using debate strategy. Because at the end of the day, you cannot cover the sort of seven or eight layers in an argument that a typical EPL speaker is able to cover. Like if you are, great, but if you're not, then in those circumstances, if you're able to cover, say, four or five, you need to make sure that those four or five layers that you're covering, whether it be in a rebuttal or an argument um, or in a setup, 
is doing more or the say at least the same as those seven or eight layers of analysis that is being useful from um, that EPL speaker. And in order to understand prioritization, you need to understand and look at this graph because this graph is very, very important. Any argument, any rebuttal, any piece of material, any setup has generally two dimensions to them um, in debating. Obviously, you can do like, you know, divide these dimensions into different parts. Like you can divide truth into like balance of probability and you can divide importance into like, you know, relevance and like whether or not you're impacting a huge number of people, whether or not you're impacting vulnerable people. But broadly speaking, any piece of material in debating has two broad dimensions. Is it important and is it true? And the most important argument in any debate, if you can find this zone where if your argument lies here, this is the most important part, right? Where it's very, very important and it's very, very true. And you can prove that it's very, very true. You can prove that it's very, very important. Most of the arguments lie here where they're somewhat true and somewhat important. Some arguments are more important than they're true. As in, by true, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be a black and white of, oh, whether or not this is true. It's rather sometimes a bit of a gray scale where it's true means it, does it apply to a majority of the people that we're talking about in this debate? Does it apply to a very vulnerable group? Or if it does apply to a vulnerable group, does it apply in the maximum number of contexts to those people? So truth obviously is not as black and white or as simple. And when it comes to importance as well, it's not as black and white or, or as simple. However, if you can convey that, no, this is very, very, very important to a lot of people, or this is very, very important to a vulnerable group, then that is considered very high impact or high importance. So when it comes to truth and importance, some arguments will be more important than they are true. Some arguments will be more true um, than they're important. And the reason I'm saying this is because you need to understand where your argument lies, roughly speaking, you don't really need to draw this map or think about it from a math perspective. However, if you have one argument that sounds very nice, but is actually not that true in the sense that, sense that it doesn't apply to that many contexts, it doesn't apply to that many circumstances, and it doesn't fulfill the criteria of being balanced, of being like likely to occur on balance of probability, where it's like, yeah, it can occur sometimes, but it's not really true for most circumstances you need to then deprioritize that argument, even if it's somewhat important, even if it's nice sounding. You need to prioritize an argument that you can prove is more robust, is the, that you can prove applies to more circumstances and is generally more um, important as well. And you have to also understand that when you're judging between two arguments where you're like, you know, both of these arguments are apply broadly to similar contexts or same number of instances, then you should prioritize the one that is more important, right? Then you should prioritize the one that affects more people, or then, then you should prioritize the one that affects more vulnerable groups. Whatever it is that you decide, then you should prioritize that. I generally prefer ensuring the argument is true or it's robust before going in, jumping into the importance or an impact because of the simple fact that like, if it's not true, then that it doesn't matter if it's not important, it's, it has already been rebutted, right? But at the same time, I do have to also acknowledge the fact that there are some arguments that are less likely to happen than other arguments, but are just more important in general, which is to say that you can frame these arguments across, let's not take the risk of um, this happening. Say, for example, you're conveying a harm that is less likely to occur more broadly, but it's just hugely more important than another particular harm that is more likely to occur then you can say that even if the probability of this happening is less, the risk of this happening is so high that I would rather in th these circumstances not take that chance and not take that risk. But all of these strategic thinking can happen once you understand the dimensions of an, any argument, any rebuttal or piece of context or setup, um, um, whatever it is, where you understand that it has to meet some level of robustness, some level of truth, and also be some level of important for you to consider. And when you see that there is an argument that lies, say, here, versus another argument that lies here, approximately speaking, then obviously prefer this argument over the other one, because they are the same level of important, but this argument is just easier to prove to be true. It's more likely to happen, um, as you can see in this particular graph, right? And again, I'm not saying that you have to think of it from a graph perspective. You, however, have to think of it from the 
oh, if these both of these arguments are similarly impactful, this argument is more true. I need to prioritize this argument. And if you already have two arguments locked in that you think must be run, like you have a principal argument that's really, really good. Obviously, principles apply to broad contexts and apply to a lot of situations and has a big sort of intuition pump as to why this is very, very important within the context of the debate. And then you have another utilitarian argument that's very, very good. Then you need to recognize the fact that your as an ESL speaker, you probably won't be able to cover th more than three arguments as a th team, not as a speaker. Sometimes I, I would cap it at two two arguments a speaker. If you are generally like covering less than a typical um EPL speaker, having said that, that obviously varies from debate to debate. There are some arguments that are just has a lower burden, like lower threshold for proving in terms of like the burden assigned to it. So you can cover more arguments in that sense. Obviously varies from debate to debate. But typically, I, would, I wouldn't recommend that an ESL team run more than three arguments. Um, and typically, I wouldn't recommend that an ESL speaker run more than two arguments um, in their speech. And in those circumstances, you absolutely have to prioritize because ESL and ESL speakers are great at coming up with arguments because they like understand so many contexts. They come from so such diverse backgrounds. But you have to prioritize. You really do have to prioritize because it's better to have two fully baked arguments than have five half baked arguments. Because the problem with half baked arguments is that they're very, very easy to rebut. They're very, very easy to take down. And you will suffer from that um, regardless of whatever team um, that you're facing. Like you might be facing an EPL team, you might be facing an ESL team or an EFL team. Regardless of what, which team you're facing, they're going to take it down um, in, in those cases. So it's very, very important um, in that case to sort of, uh, understand this um, metric of prioritization. And here, just make sure when it comes to like running arguments, run the most important two or three arguments. And when it comes to prep, if you obviously you have a brainstorming phase in prep, um, if you have like five or six arguments, please prioritize. Sometimes you can either drop the rest or you can integrate. Sometimes you'll be like, you know what? The fifth argument can actually be part of the second argument. So I'll just integrate it into the second argument. Um, and I don't want to talk about like how to construct arguments because this is not what this session is supposed to be about. Um, if you want to look at how to construct arguments or like, you know, rebuttals and like, you know, importance, there's lots of resources in YouTube. I can heavily recommend Miko Vitug's um, YouTube channel. I really like it for uh, learning a lot of the, you know, basics and the advanced advanced aspects of debating. And one of the best things that I like about it is that the videos are not too long. There's like 10, 15 minute videos on very complex topics in debating that are explained in a very simple manner. So I'd highly recommend that for um, for everyone, ESL and EFL speakers included, of course. But here you need to prioritize running the most important two or three arguments. Um, and you, in those circumstances, either drop the rest or try to integrate some of uh, these materials. And when it comes to rebuttals, rebut the most important pieces of material. Again, use that use that sort of you know graph. See if what they're running is very very true. See what they're running is very very important. See, look for weaknesses. You'll see that some of the arguments that they'll run is very very important, but it's not that true. Attack the truth aspect of this argument. Say it doesn't apply to that many contexts. Mitigate it to the extent to which you can, and take it down because if it's very, very important and they've proven that it's it can happen in a lot of cases, then you are in big trouble. Again, at the same time, if they've proven that this applies to a lot of cases, maybe it's not that important, but it still applies um, to a lot of cases and it has some impact, then again, try to address that argument and maybe talk about the impact. Weigh it out, like, you know, compare and contrast with your material and say that our material is just more important than this, even if this happens in a vast majority of the cases. Know what strategy you're using and rebut the most important pieces of material. Sometimes like, you know, there'll be like one, this throwaway argument for like 30 seconds. If someone says a throwaway argument for 30 seconds, don't spend more than say five to say 10 seconds rebutting it. It may even be worth it to just drop that material, right? You don't have to cover everything. It's not possible for you to rebut all seven minutes or eight minutes of a speaker given that you yourself have seven minutes or eight minutes where you have to do other things, right? If you're a second speaker, you have to run a substantive. If you're a third speaker, then you have to do things like, you know, um, compare, contrast, um, and frame as well. You cannot just keep on rebutting anything and everything that they speak. So prioritize, prioritize, and prioritize. That would be the tip for ESL and EFL speakers. Um, and be very, very conclusive. Be very, very conclusive when you're speaking. So 
practice saying when you once you've done piece of rebuttal or once you've done like you know these three layers in an argument practice saying in conclusion and even though it may seem oh as an ESL EFL speaker like you know it's very difficult to cover material in seven minutes why am I practicing saying in conclusion um it's it's actually more relevant for the third problem um, that I'm going to talk about, but generally speaking, it adds a lot of perspective. It adds a lot of structure to your speech. It conveys your thoughts better to judges, um, which is the third pro pro problem that I'm going to talk about. But to wrap up, when it comes to like covering material or covering as much depth of material in seven or eight minutes, it is not possible for a lot of ESL and EFL speakers to cover as much as um, the typical EPL speaker. It is, however, very, very possible to beat them. Um, your three layers or your four layers that you can do just needs to be more important than whatever seven, eight, nine layers that um, they are talking about. Also here, in terms of understanding, I've talked about like the disadvantage that ESL speakers have, which is essentially that um, we cannot cover as much material in the allotted time. One of the advantages we have, however, is that we don't really need to think about that many things um, to say. By that, I mean, I know it sounds a bit odd, by that, I mean, whenever an EPL speaker who can cover a lot of material is, is like writing their speech, they're like, oh, I need to talk about the sixth argument or the sixth layer or the seventh layer or the eighth layer. And honestly speaking, trust me when I say this, and I'm speaking from experience, in vast majority of the circumstances, anything beyond like the fourth or the fifth layer is usually bad. It's usually not that great. And this is by design, right? How many reasons can you think of why an argument is true or how many reasons can you think of why an argument is important? Once you run out of the main or the good reasons, you will run, you will come up with some reasons where you look at like, really? Why, 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 why is it important? Why, why are you saying this? Like, this is not, this is not that important. So what the whole, you know, being forced to prioritize three or four layers does to you is, if you're strategic enough, it brings out the best of the material anyways. And by design, you drop some of the irrelevant stuff. It can be quite advantageous because when you, once you keep saying some of the irrelevant stuff, because of human biases, judges will remember the most recent material sometimes and think, oh, this argument wasn't really well analyzed because some of the things that I remember about this argument is like the fifth, sixth, and the seventh layer, which are not that good, right? Obviously, good judges will track everything and all of that. But it is advantageous to not having to think of that in prep time to begin with, you're like, okay, you know what? I won't be able to cover more than this many layers in this in this specific argument. So I'll just then move on to the next argument, make it better and focus on the most important reasons as to why it, that argument is true or important. So it allows you to prioritize it, it allows you to allocate your time better in thinking uh, when it comes to prep as well. So even though it can be disadvantageous in covering a lot of material, and I understand a lot of the SLEFs and speakers get frustrated that they haven't covered um, whatever they wanted to cover, they haven't covered everything that they wanted to cover. However, it is an advantage that you are forced to cover the most important things that come to your head. And prioritization is of utmost importance. It's probably the most important thing, be being an EFL or an EFL, ESL speaker and trying to win the debate versus the best EPL speakers in the circuit, right? And as I said, in the vast majority of the circumstances, the fifth, sixth, seventh, and beyond layers are just not good. Um, yeah, I might be controversial, but that's just been from my experience of speaking and judging for a long, long time now. Having said that, what is the last thing? Because it kind of flows on from this one, the last um, barrier that I want to talk about for ESL and EFL speakers, which is that judges not understanding what you're saying and it becomes a problem with clarity at that point, right? Like you will say some things and you think that you've conveyed this argument or this particular rebuttal, but the judges just did not get it. And it, that becomes a huge problem for ESL and EFL speakers. In those circumstances, what I would heavily recommend is the following. I would recommend trying to focus on being clear. And I genuinely think for ESL and EFL speakers, it is not that difficult being clear because we learn language in the simplest version first. We learn language, the sim simplest version of English first, and then we move on to the more advanced words, more like, you know, enriching your vocabulary and all of that. Once we understand the simple version of English, we are able to convey that simple version of English. And oftentimes being clear is just talking and using simple words to convey what you're saying. 
And this is not to say you don't use the full breadth of the vocabulary that you know, but you don't also want to use very, very uncommon words. And you don't necessarily need to use very, very uncommon words. You just need to use more common words um, that people understand and convey what you're saying in the simplest way possible so that it's understandable. And clarity, by the way, is not about pronunciation at all. Um, specifically when it comes to ESL and EFL speakers, I have an accent. A lot of people, a lot of debaters have different accents, whether it be like, you know, the Japanese accent or the Indonesian accent, the Bangladeshi accent, the Filipino accent, the Indian accent, the Pakistani accent. There's so many accents out there in debating, especially when it comes to ESL and EFL speakers. It's not about accent at all. It's rather about illustrating something or explaining something in a way that it's very, very clear. So once you give one explanation of why an argument is true, try to think of an example where it applies so that it's crystal clear in the heads of the judge. Because I understand that when it comes to judges, some judges will just be thrown off by your pronunciation. That has become more unlikely as the, as the circuits, or as the debating circuits have become more progressive. But it still does happen. In those circumstances, unfortunately, it's very difficult to overcome that. However, if the judge is like, you know, the judge is somewhat understanding but not being able to track as better because as much because you're an ESL and EFL speaker, give them illustrations, give them explanations, give them examples of what you're talking about. It get it makes it easier for them to follow your speeches. So you'll see a lot of good ESL and EFL speakers are great at illustrations, great at using both hypothetical and real examples to convey their argument. That is what adds to clarity. Your clarity is about choice of words, mostly simple and common words that convey the meaning of what you're wanting to say and illustrations and explanations that that make it make your argument concrete, that make your argument or rebuttal more grounded and it's easier to explain to, through that, um, through, through the form of examples and um, illustrations. And some might say, oh, we are already an ESL EFL speaker it's very difficult for us to cover everything in seven minutes. Now you're asking us to add like examples and illustrations. Honestly, though, I think examples and illustrations should be covered by every debater. It doesn't matter if you're an ESL or EFL speaker. I'm, spe I'm emphasizing on it specifically for ESL and EFL speakers because it helps us be more clear to judges who may not perceive us, um, as e who may not understand fully what we're saying all the time because of certain EFL and ESL biases that they have. But vast majority of the judges, or at least what I would like to believe, at least puts in an attempt to listen. And when they're putting in an attempt to listen, we make it as easy for them to follow, as easy for them to write down and track. Also, as a side note, honestly, when it comes to judging as well, I see this. It's not possible for judges to track 100% of what a lot of fast EPL speakers say. It is, however, possible for a lot of judges to track at least 80 to 90% of what a slow but someone who is explaining it very clearly, someone who is covering material, but at a slower pace than most people because they're ESL or EFL, judges capture most of their speeches and that can be hugely advantageous because as a fast EPL speaker, you don't know what parts of your speech are being captured and what parts are not, and therefore what parts get lost because you're speaking that fast. But as an ESL speaker who's like slow and clear, you know for a fact that vast majority of, the, of your speech is being noted down and it's going to count when it comes to the final decision of the debate. And that can be a massive advantage. But for that, you need to be putting in effort to be clear. You need to be putting in effort to make your explanation simple and easy to follow. And these are certain things, as I said, we should know about as ESL and EFL speakers because we started learning the simple version of the language um, before we even went into the advanced vocabulary or anything else. So yeah, those would be my tips to overcome the three big barriers that ESL and EFL speakers face. Um, I hope we have more ESL and EFL champions um, and not just like, you know, generally, obviously we have our ESL and EFL category that are quite prestigious. And we also want to be able to compete in the open category in the same way that EPL speakers are able to sort of, you know, um, compete and dominate some of these categories. Sometimes I, we want to see, like we've seen a lot of ESL speakers win Australs in open category in the past years. Um, and we want to see it more when it comes to obviously Australs, but worlds um, and other majors, so to speak. So with that being said, um, best of luck for Australs, best of luck for the rest of the tournaments or rest of the majors of the year. Of the year. Um, and thank you so much for listening so far.